The following podcast is a presentation of Project Entertainment Network. Welcome to Vicious Whispers with Mark Tullius, your source for horror, sci-fi, suspense, and all things violent. Hey, what is going on, guys? Thank you so much for joining me today on Vicious Whispers, episode... What is it? Fuck. Uh, 92. Damn. Uh, Now, if you watched the last live video, you would say, hey, that was episode 92. Well, it was, except I really screwed up on the audio and the visual, so I had to scrap the whole thing. Yesterday, I refilmed it, and again, I jacked up the audio, so... I'm doing this one more time, but I thought what would be fun is to read a story. I was going to play Numbered Days. That's a cool short story off of Untold Mayhem. Um, But instead of that, I'm going to read Surviving the Holidays, which is off of Twisted Reunion. I think uh, T. Quone did an excellent job on this thing, but I want to do it myself. I haven't read it in a while. The story is, shit, uh, 12 years old. Wrote in... Or it was published in 2008, so it was probably even a couple years before that, before I even sold it. But then I reworked it for Twisted Reunion, and it's still one of my favorite stories. And definitely a Christmas story, so hopefully you will enjoy it. I don't recommend having the kids around. Not for this one, though. Um, Speaking of Christmas, we gave my son his Christmas present early, and that was... I'm not going to say it was a mistake, but I haven't slept for the last two nights. Well, I haven't slept well for the last two nights because we gave him his Christmas present early and it was a cute little kitten that makes a lot of noise, that's kind of scared, that, oh man. Uh, So I slept in my son's room for the first, well, the last two nights. The first night I slept on the floor because we didn't want the cat trying to get up on the bunk bed and jumping. And so I slept on the floor, which was super uncomfortable and the cat was just meowing all night long. And then uh, last night was, again, pretty rough. Uh, Not as bad, but still bad. So if you are getting someone an animal for Christmas, make sure to check with the parents. And I know, I said I was cool with it. I I even said I would take two cats, even though I'm allergic. Um, But I'm glad we ended up just getting the one. It's a pretty cool cat. I think his name is going to be Midnight. Uh, He's all black. We're trying to think of something cooler, but it is my son's cat, so we decided we should let him name it. As far as other things going on, I did want to give you guys a quick rundown on the new publishing schedule. Uh, One of the things I've been doing with my business coach, Sean, from Black Diamond Club, is uh, he's kind of reeling me in. My goal was to do seven books next year, which would have been super overwhelming. Um, It would have taken all my time just to create them. I don't even know if I would have been able to. And then to try to release them, that would have been rushing everything super fast. So um, we talked about the importance of slowing down and spending just as much time marketing as we are creating. And so the, the last two weeks, I've been working on my whole budget. I've been working on my strategy. I've been figuring out which books I want to release first and the order of those. So what we're looking like, Next year will probably only be three books. So we got Try Not to Die Super High, uh, for sure. I've been having a lot of fun with that one. Steve Montgomery did an awesome job. I just cleaned up uh, the first 22 chapters. Uh, Twenty, the, the final chapter we're still not certain of, uh, but he's going to go over that. He'll give it back to me. I'll do another pass. And then we also have to clean up all the death scenes. So we'll be doing that as well. But if we really push it, I think we should have that done by uh, February and it'll be released by May. But if you are on my launch team, if you're one of my newsletter subscribers that wants to be on my launch team, then you will get that review copy very early. Uh, The next book coming out is The Traumatic Brain Injury. Again, this is one that I've been kind of lagging on. I just haven't been haven't been wanting to write it. I'd much rather write fiction. Fiction is way more fun, but I also understand the Traumatic Brain Injury book is important. It's not going to be a very thick book at all. It's going to be, in fact, most of the books that I've read on the brain, unless they're a science book, science-based book, um, they're not that thick. And it's probably a good thing because most people that are going to be reading a book on traumatic brain injuries probably have very short attention spans, uh, like I did. And I still kind of do. So that book won't be that long. I've already written the majority of it. I just need to stick with it. So I'm going to have that one done by May, and hopefully it will be out uh, a couple months after that. 
And then the last one for the year will be Try Not to Die in the Wizard's Tower. Uh, Sage Ricci is doing a kick-ass job on that. Um, I really, I don't even know how much I'm going to be able to help with that one because he does such an incredible job. Um, he's an excellent writer. In fact, him and Tom Spanbauer, those are my writing mentors. They're the ones that kind of uh, helped me find this new voice, made the biggest difference in my career, in my writing style, and also taught me how much writing can help other people, how much it can be an emotional breakthrough experiences. Uh, which is what I'm going to be sharing when I start doing my writing class next month. Um, the first one is going to be, I think, January 11th. That will be for all military. It's five days. And then the next one after that, two weeks later, will be all first responders. And then in February, it will be opened up to the public. So for all you normal people. Uh, but I think it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be pretty intense. It's going to be uh, pretty emotional. But I think that a lot of good is going to come out of it. So... I'm excited about that. Also excited to be having a brand new website coming out uh, probably the first week of January. Uh, Clay Mosley from Dripify is creating that and it looks awesome. Uh, he just sent me the rough draft of it. I just need to fix up some stuff and go from there. Uh, but I got sidetracked. So another thing that's going to be happening is it, we're writing uh, The Bridge. Now that is a book that I should have probably already finished. I actually started that book before I uh, wrote Ain't No Messiah. It was going to be the first book in the series and it got pushed back. Um, I think I have like 40,000 words. Once I sit down and knock it out, it won't take me that long. I'm telling myself it's going to take about four months. So I want to have that one done by the end of the year as well. But that one won't be out until 2022. Um, and then also I'm going to be pushing back uh, Try Not to Die in the Wild West and Try Not to Die in 25 Perfect Days. Those will also be 2022. 20, Not sure what else I will be releasing. Um, but that's it for now. And now some of those books, maybe they will change. Maybe some will come out a little bit earlier. Maybe some will get pushed back. I never know. But that is the game plan. And uh, yeah, let's get to it. Let's get to the story. All right. So this one is coming from Twisted Reunion. This is Surviving the Holidays. If I could turn to the right page, I will begin to read it. Uh, Shades of Death. We should have read that one. That's way better. Well, I shouldn't say it's better. And it's not a Christmas story. All right, here we go. Surviving the Holidays. At 12 years old, Paul began to suspect he was jaded. He wasn't entirely certain he knew what it meant, but that's the word that popped into his head, and it felt right. What other explanation could there be for a kid hating Christmas? Paul just couldn't wait for this day to be over. The squeals of his brothers and sisters rummaging through presents only making it worse. He didn't want it to be this way. In fact, he envied his younger siblings. He wished he could feel their joy. But in the Harrison household, when you reached a certain age, Christmas lost its innocence. Presents no longer mattered. The time had come for Paul and his older brother Ron, who was slumped next to him on the couch. They had both seen too much and remembered too well. Jonathan and Francis, the blue-eyed twins, rattled boxes to their ears, trying to guess what was inside. Emily fluffed a bow that had been gotten smashed in the stacking, and Tina, who had just turned five, was begging for help. She would somehow gotten herself tangled in a string of garland. Mother let out a little snort from the kitchen. Ron, help your sister. Ron grabbed an end of the garland and twirled little Tina around and around until she was finally free. From the laughter and cheer, you'd never know the family had lost five children on this very day. There were reminders, though. Their stockings still hung above the chimney. Their homemade ornaments dangled on branches. The slips of paper with everyone's names. And Tommy's misshapen star on top of the humongous fake pine. But these reminders were nothing compared to Emily's missing index finger or Jonathan's wheelchair. Ron wore a long-sleeved t-shirt to hide his scars, but Paul had seen them all before. The 15-year-old looked like he'd run naked through a field of barbed wire. And finally, there was Tina, and the puckered pink skin around her little glass eye. She was the only one who didn't remember how she'd gotten hurt. Paul envied her the most. Only five minutes to midnight, and Christmas would officially begin. Then they'd vote and open presents. Paul wondered if any other families had stupid rituals like theirs. Francis stood up. 
Paul had seen his mangled face a thousand times, but it always looked worse at night in the shadows. Francis said, I'm going to clean up this year. Who wants to bet? Jonathan said, It's a little hard to tell. Yours are pretty heavy, but I bet you ever anything that Emily's were worth more. He whispered. She asked for jewelry. Emily pushed Jonathan's wheelchair. You can't tell people what I asked for. You know the rules. Jonathan stuck out his foot to keep from crashing into the wall. Francis dragged a box out from behind the tree. Check this one out. It's the biggest one. It must weigh over 50 pounds. No way. Jonathan spun back and said, Maybe Mom got me the weights I wanted. Francis said, It's Paul's. Paul ran over and read the tag. It's a mistake. That's not mine. It has your name on it, Emily said. It's not mine. I only asked for clothes. Francis tried to shake the present, but it barely budged. These are some heavy clothes. Only clothes. That's all I asked for, I swear. Ron said, Why would we believe you? Because I'm telling you, it's not mine. Jonathan did a quick count. It's yours. He pointed out a pile of boxes by the ottoman. And these are your others. Paul told himself weight didn't mean anything. Two years ago, the wrapping on one of Brian's gifts had been torn, revealing a new computer box. But inside, there were only rock-filled socks. Less than a minute to midnight, and Paul still hadn't made up his mind. Sometimes it was better not to, just to go with instinct, but this year he felt he should give his decision a little more thought. Now that Tina was old enough, things could get interesting. A loud ho-ho-ho bellowed from the hallway, and out came Paul's mother and father, both dressed as Mr. and Mrs. Claus. His dad adjusted his fake beard and grabbed his gut. Merry Christmas, children! He slung a red velvet sack over his shoulder. It sounded like metal clanging inside. Mrs. Claus handed everyone a pencil and a piece of paper. The kids scattered and started scribbling. Paul looked over at Emily, who covered her slip. Tina asked, Why do I have to vote? I don't want to. In a deep Santa voice, Dad said, Do you want presents? She shuffled her feet and nodded. Mom guided her to the table and helped her hold the pencil. Do you want two extra presents? Mom whispered. Tina's eyes brightened. She nodded even faster. Then vote for whose presents you want. She eagerly, eagerly looked around the room. Anyone's? That's the rule, Mom said. But that's not fair, Jonathan whined. She doesn't even know what her vote means. I do too, Tina said. She's five now. Those are the rules and it's already after midnight, Mom said. Dad took off his Santa hat and bopped Tina's head with a fluffy white ball. Hurry up, he said. Tina plopped to her knees and scribbled a name. The other kids dropped their slips into the hat. Emily dropped hers as if it were on fire. Ron tossed his in. Paul still hadn't decided. Tick tock, Paul, his mother said. Francis threw down his pencil. You do this every fucking year. Just write down a name. Mom smacked the back of Francis' head. Language! Ow! Paul felt everyone's eyes. Could they have actually picked him this time? He figured he'd had another year at least. He'd always sworn if his name was called, he wouldn't be like the others. He'd go out with a fight. But now his legs began to shake. Paul remembered he was the one who cried because he hadn't, he had only gotten one Christmas present. It's how this all started. Dad shoved the hat into Paul's chest. Paul finally dropped the name. It seemed to fall in slow motion. Mom took the hat and stepped into the middle of the room. Okay, listen up. We're only counting this once unless there's a tie. She pulled out a handful of the slips and read the first. We have one for Paul. She held it up for everyone to see. She turned the next paper over and sounded fairly surprised when she read Paul's name again. That's two. Paul's name was called a third time. He sunk back into the couch. One more vote and that was it but he still had the chance for a tie. His mom looked at the next slip and turned to Paul. Oh, I'm sorry, honey. Can you read the rest? Paul asked. It doesn't matter, Jonathan said. I just want to know, Paul said. He's stalling, Emily said. Mom looked at the last two slips. Wow, six votes. That's unanimous, Francis said. Dad grabbed Paul's arm. You voted for yourself? 
Paul stared at the slips covering the table. He always voted for himself because he didn't want to feel responsible. He just never thought it'd actually come back to hurt him. He'd assumed he was the likable one. Paul's mother picked up the red velvet sack and dropped it on the table. His father continued to berate him for not being man enough to write down someone else's name. Paul just stood there watching his mother dump out the gleaming contents of the sack. Okay, she said. Who wants Paul's presents? Tina and Emily dove for the table. Jonathan rolled over Francis's foot. Francis punched his brother's neck. Are you stupid? Paul leapt toward the table, knocking both of them out of the way. He reached for the wooden handle of the jagged bread knife. Hey, he's supposed to wait, Tina said. Paul's father grabbed his shoulder and dug his big, meaty fingers deep into Paul's clavicle. Instinctively, Paul spun, bringing the knife up and slicing through the Santa suit. The sound of the blade carving through his father's stomach was muffled under the padded costume, but he was no longer the invisible, invincible titan of Paul's childhood. His father took hold of the knife, tried to stop Paul from twisting it, but Paul dropped a little lower and drove the blade against the bottom rib bone. His father began to falter. Paul pulled the knife out, slicing through his father's palm. He went to stab his old man again, but a blinding white pain ripped through his lower back. Paul whipped around, his knife tearing through the air until it met Francis's cheek. Francis cried out and dropped his butcher knife. Paul turned back to his father, who was now on his knees. Another blade tore through Paul's arm, but he concentrated on his father. He stood over him, stabbing in and out of the soft, bulging skin at the back of his father's skull. The blood poured and dripped through the fake beard. Paul's Achilles snapped and he fell. He saw the bubbled flesh of his forearm as he raised his knife to all, of his, all five of his brothers and sisters. He didn't want to hurt them. He knew they felt the same, or at least that's what he wanted to believe as Ron plunged the wooden skewer into Paul's chest. Francis drove his knife into Paul's left arm. Emily stabbed his right. No longer able to keep his grip, Paul's knife clanged to the ground. Tina stepped forward and dragged her tiny steak knife across his throat. Paul smiled and took the weapon from her trembling hands. Gently, he made turn, Tina turn and face his pile of presents. All right, guys, that is it. That was Surviving the Holidays from Twisted Reunion. Hopefully you enjoyed the story, and hopefully you have a much happier holiday than this family did. All right, guys, I'm out of here. I will talk to you guys next week. Later. This has been a presentation of the Project Entertainment Network.